running from the starting gate on this new edition of the National Racing Report. You've got it locked on MSG+. Plus. That's obviously a look at the Mecca, New York City's racetrack, the Big A. Glad you're with us from our clubhouse studios. Richard Migliori, Andy Serling, Jason Blute alongside. A ton to talk about. Good dose of controversy and 170 Kentucky Derby points up for grabs this past weekend. Yeah, it was just a great weekend of racing. I mean, a great day of racing. We had huge names running yesterday, but obviously a lot of controversy and a lot for us to talk about. Yeah, I was actually so excited about this. I was having a hard time falling asleep last night. Let's just jump right into it. Let's get right into it. Feels like we've done this before. We get them in the gate, the Fountain of Youth, and we'll spend, by the way, a good portion of the show at Goldstream Park and Fairgrounds. But we'll start things out with the three-year-olds and the uh, three-year-old cast in the Fountain of Youth. And I'll send it to you guys as this field makes its way into the clubhouse turn. One of the things I think is important to discuss before we talk about the disqualification is Frosted, who was a bit disappointing in this race, to say the least. But this was a racetrack. A lot of times people use racetracks as excuses. This was a very slow, tiring racetrack. And unfortunately, also the only two-turn dirt race. But this was a very fast pace, especially the second quarter. And when you think they went 47-4 and four to the half, but came their last four and a half furlongs in 58 and two. I think it puts it in perspective, Richie. Yeah, it really does. And essentially, that's trotting horse time coming home. And, you know, you, you make a great point about the pace. The thing that I can't get past, though, is just visually how easy he's going. And if you'll see, when they get into the turn, he's still cruising when it looks like upstarts off the bridle. No doubt, watching this race live, you wondered what Frosted was going to win by. And I do wonder if maybe the Briars were a little confused. And I think that Luis Saez did the right move here a little bit with the horse who was placed first. It's a knockout because he gives him a little breather. You see the guy in him is very active and you see Jose Ortiz getting an upstart. I don't think they all realized how quickly they were going. Yeah, and the race really did speed up there. It's a great point. I don't know that Luis Saez necessarily consciously Maybe did that. Outrun. I think he just got outfooted around the turn. Yeah, no, I think that's very, very possible here. Frosted may not want to go this far, ultimately, at least against this caliber of force, but I just don't think his effort was as bad as it, it, it might look at first glance because you thought he was going to win. Upstart got a little lazy here. He didn't run his best race, but he still finished well first. Now comes the bumping. Yeah, I mean, and, and the initial contact was actually started by Frosted, who took a step out into him. I think what warranted the disqualification, or what made them make the disqualification, because I don't know if it was warranted, was when he drifted out later in the stretch. No, I, I totally agree with that, and we'll take a look at the head-on a little bit in a few seconds here, and you'll see, because Frosted comes out, and he gives the hardest and big initial slam, and keep in mind, that's a Rod Ortiz running into his brother, Jose Ortiz, and a lot of this herding starts in New York, where they allow it to go on, and these guys ride in New York. After that, the first drift goes, you'll see, you're going to see Frosted come out. There it is. He forces him out, and he causes the whole thing, but then Jose exacerbates it with that left-handed whip. Well, exactly. The initial contact, I, I don't think, would have warranted a change. Nothing would have happened. It was later on, and he felt the presence from the outside, and they're so used to doing this in New York. When someone's coming to your outside or your inside, they go to meet them. It's classic herding, and what's allowed in one jurisdiction, obviously they allow it a lot in New York, is not necessarily allowed in another jurisdiction. Well, another thing, Richie, we talk about is it's one thing to try to herd, but you can lose control of your horse a little bit when doing it. And that seems to be what happened here with Jose as he drifted far and he would want to do it. One of the reasons I think it looks worse than it was is that Upstart may have been simultaneously running away from the second place finisher. It's a knockout. And give Luis Saez credit. He did a little bit of the Oscars are tonight. He did a little bit of an Oscar. He's not quite Richard Migliore yet, hmm. but he's working on his mega impersonation. That was pretty good. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and they fell for it. And I think when you look at what one of the biggest problems with this was there was an inquiry in the 12th race where there was clear cut herding and bumping by the winner in a very close photo yeah. and the stewards left it up. And you put these two together in an important race like this. And it's hard to believe that justice was done. Yeah, especially when you when you think upstart. The way he drew away, I think he was the best horse on the day regardless. And again, you go back to Stewart's. You want consistency. When you feel like it's not adjudicated the same way day to day, or in this case, race to race, it's a very frustrating thing for people that are wagering on it, obviously the people participating. And then you've got to go about jurisdictions. 
what's allowed in one jurisdiction not necessarily allowed in another. As a trainer or a jockey, you have to know what's allowed in each jurisdiction. It, it, it kind of makes a case for there should be one national standard. Right. You get no argument from any of us. And we'll look at the rampart a bit later in the show. That was a race in which there was a steward's inquiry to jockey's objection, and they left it alone, and you guys can talk about that. But let's, let's mention the winner here. It's a knockout who's lightly raced, was running for the third time, and he's the third career win in the Fountain of Youth for trainer Todd Pletcher. The race got a 90, the winner upstart got a 95 buyer. And I think it's a little bit made up because it's the only one to turn race. I don't sure. think it's outlandish. If anything, it's a little high, but it's right. not terribly bad. So it's a knockout, got a figure of Rennie, 9 or 90. I think he got a reasonably good setup in here. I sure. don't know what – he did take a step forward from his last race, but he's got to take another big step forward because Upstart's a better horse than this, and he's going to run better probably going forward. Well, and that's what I took away from the race. I thought it was a subpar effort for him that he was still able to win, and he showed courage by gutting it out, and you like to see that. You know, when horses have things go their own way and they win, it's one thing, but when a horse actually has an off day and still wins, that, that points them out. It's exactly what I said to Rick Violet when I talked to him last night. I said, you know, when the dust settles and you're not annoyed anymore about the disqualification, he, you know, he understood the whole thing, obviously. He's been around. I said, your horse probably ran the worst race he's ever run, and he still won. That's a pretty big feather in that horse's cap. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I took away from it. Right, and post-race, it sounds like Rick was, was fairly bullish on bringing Upstart here for the Wood Memorial. Mm -hmm. This is his uh, New York base, of course, and we look forward to uh, Upstart in Queens, and we'll see if Todd Pletcher obviously leaves. It's a knockout down there for the Florida Derby on March 28th. Out to the fairgrounds, here we go. Another, uh, another dose of Kentucky Derby points up for grabs. 85 total, 50 to the winner with this big field in the Risen Star out in the Midwest. I, I don't know, and you and I talked about it a little beforehand, and, you know, listen, I mean, International star overcomes an outside post here and got a sensational ride by Miguel Mena here. He may not win the Derby. He may not go on and do any bigger and better things, but he's a pretty neat horse. He's a really neat horse. He's handy. He's courageous. If he gets the right setup, who knows? Maybe that's why he overachieves, but I agree with you. From that post to find the rail, and Miguel Mena, you could see it was a conscious effort, too. It didn't happen by accident. He was looking for that break, and he made it happen. Yeah, and it was a quick pace, but it's a slower pace, actually, than Rachel Alexander that we'll take a look at next. The Philly race run just a half an hour earlier. And, you know, this horse, what I like about him, he does the same thing here we saw him do in the little comp. He gets in some traffic trouble. Okay, he's saving ground. All right, fine. But a lot of horses, and we talk about it, whether it's kickback, it's being in tight, get discouraged, they spit the bit. Not this guy. He gets encouraged by a little bit of trouble. Yeah, it almost looks like it emboldens him. It gets his blood up a little bit. And, you know, you can see his head carriage. He never thinks about the kickback. He drops his head and runs through it. You think back to his father's derby. Now, I'm not saying he's as talented as his father. He was like driving a car through traffic. His son inherited that ability. Well, and his dad is obviously Fusaichi Pegasus. Now, let's mention Imperia in the Godolphin Blue. Well, this is a turf horse, and he was 3-2 to two in here, and he's second to last or last on the outside. He's not a dirt horse. He ran well at Churchill. There's some discussion, agreements, disagreements, that Churchill's dirt track is a little kinder to some turf horses. He also probably was third best that day in that race at Churchill, and I just think he's ultimately a turf horse, and people... Don't respect surface enough sometimes, Richie. Yeah, well, I, I think it's interesting. I mean, the, the quote from Kieran McLaughlin before the race was, we started him out on the turf for the distance, not necessarily the surface. Well, I think maybe this race kind of exposes that maybe the surface is a little more agreeable to him. Turf. Yeah, he just seems to be a better horse than the turf. It's just rare. You know, Barbaro was such a, a, an anomaly, and even Animal Kingdom. It's very rare that horses can be equally talented, especially high level on all surfaces. It's a rare quality, and Imperius, by the way, Imperia hasn't yet shown us that he's a superstar in the turf anyway. He's no. a good horse who had a lot of trouble in the Breeders' Cup juvenile turf race. Mm -hmm. We don't even know if he may have to be a significantly better dirt horse to be successful in these races, and that seems unlikely. Yeah, it, it, especially for this effort. Because I mean, he had his opportunity when they got in the stretch to come out and clear and really kick on, and he didn't kick on. Interesting, though, the winner, International Star, actually started his career on the turf as well. But, boy, you got to like him. He just puts his head down and does his job. And he's a New York bred the Boot, which adds to the uh, the flavor of international star. Well, if it hadn't been for the disqualification of Gulfstream, it would have been nothing but New York Reds winning no the kidding. triple crown. Yeah, it's call. pretty cool. International stars, all right. You know, War Story broke a little slowly. Yeah. He was a little wider than international star, but you know what? Breaking slowly didn't hurt him in this race. It enabled him to get good position. I think he was just second best the second time in a row in international star. He has just been a little bit worse. I'm not saying he's necessarily worse. I still wonder if these are major derby contenders. Fair enough. Let's turn the page. We stay at fairgrounds. We go to the three-year-old Philly. 
Philly division now, named, of course, for one of the greats. Her uh, campaign as a three-year-old in 09 was, uh, was great stuff, one of the best of all time. And here comes the field off the far turn in the Rachel Alexandra. I tell you something, Larry, Larry Jones is a jugger. We talk about Pletcher at Gulfstream. I don't want any part of running against Larry Jones. He runs one, two in here. And what you have to like about I'm Chatterbox, and this was a very good ride by Giroux, getting good position with her from the outside post. Instead of wiring the field, setting her own pace last time out in the Silver Bullet Day, she gets an outside post in here and easily rates and still wins. Yeah, you love when a horse is that versatile. Sure. And uh, you know what you say about Florent and Giroux, it's amazing what a big win like a Breeders' Cup can do for a guy's confidence. You could just see he knows that he can win big races now. And, and, and it's just like breaking through that plane, and it, it seems like it's just really carried him on to more success. No, he's definitely riding with confidence, and a filly like that gives you confidence. And to be fair in here, they actually only ran about .28 seconds slower than the boys did. And considering how open this three-year-old Philly division is, right. we'll see if Larry Jones can diamond shatterbox to run that well outside of fairgrounds if he can. She's a major player. We'll yeah. see a barn that's batting above 30% in the winner of Philly by Munnings. As we come home to the Big A, three-year-old Phillies, how bad it? A fast buyer speed figure after a tough beginning, at least for a, a stride and a half with Condo Commando from the outside in the snow. This is what I love about Junior Alvarado. He does the right thing. She breaks a little awkward a little inward. She falls back in there and Junior says, I'm riding the best filly. She's too fast for these horses. I ain't fooling around. Yeah, and, and he did it with without riling up too much, just allowing her to do it, almost like a whisper. And she had broken, kind of slipped behind, and that's why she kind of got off to that break into the inside. But um, he's riding with a lot of confidence. This is a good filly. One disturbing thing for me, not switching leads to the stretch. Well, that's something I can't comment on and obviously a, a very valid point. You know, She's had, and she did have some trouble early in this race, and you don't want to discount that, but she's had things very much her own way when she's had these big wins. But she's running fast races, Richie, and I can't wait to see her get seriously challenged in a race and see what she has, because there is a real chance that she's the best horse in this division. Yeah. It's a very good may, point. She may not be, end up being, but there's a chance. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I always go back to her spin away after breaking slow from the inside and then sweeping them off the feet. Now, I know it was a sloppy track that day, but for a two-year-old filly to be able to do that showed that she was special that day. No, I, I agree. In this race, even, they went 48 and 3 to the half. Make no mistake, that was a rapid pace. We talked about the race at Gulfstream. Well, they came home in 58 and 4. It's a mile, a mile and a 16th. So that was a fast pace. And it looked like Paula Silver Lining, who may have some distance limitations, but it looked like getting a perfect trip. She might get her right. to stretch, and she has another gear. And I like that she has these extra gears. Yeah, and the fact that she wasn't all in to win. She's 4 for 5 now in her career. And in her wins, she's been completely dominating. She's a good one and could have been yours for 75000 first time out last summer at the spa. We talked Talk about the Belmont Stakes at BelmontStakes.com, and we head back down to Gulfstream Park in a second. Summer starts here. It's the 147th running of the Belmont Stakes and the Belmont Stakes Festival, June 4th through the 6th. Three days, 17 stakes races at the Taj Mahal, and $10 million on the line. The third leg and oldest and longest of the Triple Crown, BelmontStakes.com, and those tickets are on sale. And talking about Condo Commando going forward, sounds like the immediate plan, no surprise, the gazelle here on the Wood Memorial undercard. The acorn, though, seems to have her name on it, looking at her talents. Well, um, she's obviously a horse that's going to be in the race, and we've got a lot of race to discuss here, but I'm sure the three of us could spend the entire rest of the show talking about how excited we are at some of the potential races we're going to see on Belmont Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right, speedy three-year-old fillies, we get back down to Gulfstream Park, and a bit of an upset in the uh, Devona Dale of very big field, and we'll pick it up in progress with the winner on the lead at 25 to 1. You know, Richie and I talked about the forward gal, which was sort of the prep for the Devona Dale last time, and we've talked about this excessively on talking horses, on trips and traps. When you have races that are meltdowns, like the forward gal with these suicidal paces and all the horses that do running at the end, do their running at the end, you want horses that did well surviving the pace. And that leads us to Akadi's Phaeton, who was dueling the whole way and finished fourth beaten less than four lengths and six lengths ahead of a horse in the race named Enchantress, who was 20 to one, and this horse was 26 to one. This horse was value. Yeah, you know, and that's something that I've learned from you. You've pointed out, you know, you, you want to look past that, the horses that were in the teeth of something and hung around longer. But how game was she? It looked like she was going to be third at one point, and she just kept fighting for it. you got to love the determination. I bet a couple dollars on her, and turning for home, I saw the others coming, and I said, well, it was, you know, a good bet, but I'm not going to get the money. And then you realize during the 
the stretch, they weren't getting by her. Let's give her the wire some credit, though. She took advantage of the meltdown we talked about. But in this race, with a, not a slow pace, but a, a fairer pace and a more, less, you know, sort of um, contested pace, she put herself a little bit closer to the game, and she still ran okay. And she ran really well, and it's interesting, too. You, we talked about the disqualification earlier. Now, there was no contact here. Drifting. The winner drifted a considerable ways, and that hurts a horse, especially a young horse, when they're outside like, like Bird at the Wire was. They get lost a little bit there. And I think that might have hurt her, too, that drifting in the stretch. What a Saturday for Luis Saez. Got the uh, DQ win in the Fountain of Youth and also the victory in the uh, Devona Dale for trader of Bill Kaplan. We may get an Oscar tonight. At the yeah, well, we <laughs> shall see. Let's move on to uh, race number six of 12. We are just about at the halfway point, and in the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the look of things, we have got a returning champion who was just terrific on Saturday in the McDermott. I think back to you and I watching the race live, and Twilight Eclipse who just... Poor Twilight Eclipse. He keeps running his heart out. He looked the winner, but as I said to you and we were talking about it, you can never count main sequence out. No, and you can see how confident Rajiv Mirage is here. And wait until he turns his stick over. The horse is going to find another gear, and he actually points his head at um, Twilight there Eclipse, is. and then he goes after him. And there were a few things that I really liked besides the ride, which I thought was outstanding. Getting him out of the space and saw in the back. Well, especially stretch. Paco Lopez is shadowing him, yep. intent on keeping him blocked, and he was able to extricate himself after saving ground on the first first two turns, so he gave up the ground on the third turn. He broke with his field this time, and when he ran through the wire, instead of his ears coming up and his head coming up, which he has a want to do to pull up, he ran through the finish. You can see his demeanor here. This is this is a very good first. I mean, he ran for about 50 yards in the whole race, and, you know, I mean, speed figures don't mean a lot to me in turf races anyway. He got 100 fire for what it's worth, but he didn't even run it all in this race. He's a terrific horse. I love main sequence, and I hope I'm wrong, but... I, I'm dubious that he'll be successful at all in Dubai, but he's fooled me Why? Before. Why are you dubious with him going over there? I think that he has an advantage because of his um, being more used to running in these kind of tracks when they ran in, in the race over in California with the shippers coming. And I know he technically was flattered when the horse that he beat, the European, came back and won in Hong Kong. But I think going over there, even though the racetrack's more like ours, I just think it favors the Europeans. He's going to meet some tough horses over there. I just don't know if he can beat them. I agree. I agree with you, but from co completely different reasons. I think the Lasix makes a big difference oh, with this horse. Disagree. And you know, with his attitude and the way he acts in the gate, Lasix has a tendency to take a little edge off a horse, just quiet them down a little bit. I think without that there, it's going to be more difficult. Uh, I think that's a very good point, Richie. Listen, I hope we're wrong, and yeah. he's a good horse, and he'll run well. There's no reason not to run him, though. He's not going to miss any major races. He, he can still come back and run in the Manhattan. And, right, and, and he's, he's a, a gelding. gelding. And Graham Motion's done a fantastic job, and yep. it was terrific to see Rajiv Mirage back aboard main sequence. Let's uh, stay on the turf in a Gulfstream Park. A, a pretty nice win out of Long on Value, who's been a hard-trying and fairly consistent turf horse by Value Plus. Tough post, but got himself up into contention. In fact, he's right outside the winner, and he, he will uh, just power away in the stretch for Bill Mott. Yeah, no, this is vintage Mott. You know, the guys, you know, Mott, whether it's Mott or Chad Brown, that get these horses and slowly improve them. This is a horse. He's done a sensational job with him. He could have a pretty good year. He ran well in here, Richie. He ran really well because I thought he kind of middle moved up to the position. And then Joel Rosario kind of throttled him. And then he was able to kick on again. Only good horses can do that. From an outside post, he was forced to have to run a significant portion of this mile race. And he was very strong at the finish. And I don't think you can ask any more from a horse. And with a trainer like Bill Mott, with a horse that's improving and runs a race like this early, why can't he go forward? And don't be afraid of wise Dan, man. Run against him at Keeneland. Take Take your shots. Oh, absolutely. When a horse is good, well, I think you said it the other day. Alan Jerkins said, never shy away from race because of one horse. And we'll see a chief horse, Chief and Jimmy, coming up. They'll pull off a mild upset a short time from now in the Rampart. Stay tuned. For now, though, Christoph Kamant. Irish mission. She is at the top of her game, and she'll get the money in the uh, very one outrunning uh, repost to return off a long layup with a good race for Bill Mott. I'm not going to get on my soapbox about these ridiculousnesses of some of the times we seem to see at Gulfstream, whether it's a Trackus issue or not. You know I have a greatest amount of respect for Trackus, but these times are clearly not accurate. They just weren't going that slowly in here. Uh, the first two did have an advantage being good horses and going a slow pace. Caroline Thomas a little unlucky. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I, I've got to just 
wax poetic about Johnny Velasquez, and you know he put her in every he right. Her I mean, he just yep. he really yep. he understands that she doesn't have a huge turn of foot, so she has to be involved, and he allows her to start marching on around the turn to keep re repost, uh, you know, a little bit um, honest, and and didn't the confidence level? Look at the hand ride and the way he finished that. From a former rider's perspective, it's fun to watch. No, that. that's that is the best thing that John Velasquez does, and you can say, oh, it's a little thing. It's not. And he does, yes, he rides a lot of Pletcher horses in Florida, and they aren't put him in this position, but Johnny knows about getting horses in the game when you have to have them in the game. Yeah, and, and, and he does it, like you say, consistently. Yes, it's not like one day it happens and one day it doesn't. It's not by accident. No, there are kinds of horses that there is no better rider than John Velasquez. And it sounds like she's got a date Irish mission with Tappet, but they may postpone that breeding because they, uh, they were talking about coming back in the orchard off that win yesterday. And why not for Christoph Kamat, who, by the way, took down Sunday evening time Regarding Singapore, won a $3 million race over in Singapore. With a Florida bed Paranda. Pretty amazing. Yeah, pretty amazing. And the, uh, off the uh, Belmont Stakes winning year with Tonalist, Christophe Kamant gets another million dollar plus purse. Let's move on to the rampart now, and uh, I'll send it to you guys. Wedding Toast was the big favorite. She's had some issues staying around on a regular basis. She's in the Godolphin blue inside. The winner's moving three wide. Wedding Toast was never able to get into a comfortable position, dueling inside or between horses in here, and a perfect trip for house rules. I'm not sure why Javi's waving the right-handed whip here with a horse that's going to win the race. You're supposed to get away from those horses. And to be honest with you, and I love Javi, I thought he asked for trouble in this race. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You, you have to basically not get, put yourself in a position to fail. Get away! And, and you're running by them. You don't have to make it tight. Yeah, he kind of was surprised. Was it a bit of a wise guy? Just being cute? Yeah, just being a little cute. Looks it looks like, like it, doesn't yeah. it? It does look like it to me. I mean, you know, he, he's breaking his left hand off the rein to kind of steer to keep her tight on those horses. He's waving the stick at her right-handed. And uh, I think, like you said, you're just asking for trouble. Yeah, I mean, she has had the perfect trip. I mean, maybe, and it fairly, he didn't feel he had as much horse under him as it might have looked like he had. And he was worried, but just stay away from those horses. And they left her up, and it was the right move, and a lot of it was because sheer drama, the horse who was somewhat interfered with it, it was a bit of an acting job by Joe Bravo, uh, did get second here, so the order of finish wasn't affected. Well, two, two thoughts out of it. Obviously, if she's beaten for second, yes, they probably take it down, and uh, Joe Bravo's also up for the same uh, yeah, right. award <laughs> as uh, Louis Saez. <laughs> tight race. Uh, big smiles <laughs> with the Jerkins plan. Jimmy's obviously the trainer of record, but you get the feeling, and it's the case, uh, House Rules in those formative stages had uh, the great H. Allen Jerkins sending her out. Absolutely, and he had been her trainer, and he he somebody who, who we all love and respect, and it was nice to see her get a good trip and a great stake for once after getting some lousy trips. In them. Yeah. Now, Bill Mott, Bill Mott, his barn got the money in the Canadian turf with long on value. Maybe a frustrating Saturday down at Gulfstream looking aside from that win. Puka was fourth in the Devona Dale, and this was a tough beginning for Mean Seas, and a lot of time and effort went back to bringing this a talented horse back to the races. He just didn't get off all that alertly in the Gulfstream sprint race. I wonder if standing in the gate as long as they did had somewhat of an effect on it. Um, but it, it definitely, you'll see him get left here. And I want Richie to talk about what's going through Arado Ortiz's mind at this point. He's the five horse. Well, you know he's so fast. And, and I think in hindsight, maybe you want to take a little more hold of him and try to tip him down. But he kind of gets full head of steam here. And what are you going to do? I mean, you kind of got to allow him to go forward. Um, and he did it smooth enough. It wasn't like he sent them there. The horse is pretty much carrying him there. Well, we've seen it with this horse. He's about as smooth going a fast horse as I've ever seen. And one of the things that served him well with that was he did break very sharply here at Aqueduct last year. So he fastly got the lead. You knew he was in trouble at this point because of what he had to do to get there. But as you say, if a rod gets in his way, it probably blows up in his face more than this does. Unfortunately, it was eased. He's got a lot of issues. Hopefully we see him again, but this was disappointing. Well, you, and you're going to see as they come off the turn, pay attention to his stride. I mean, it, he, he's not running comfortably. He doesn't look like he's he's uh, the soundest of horses. And usually when they're that fast, Andy, they have issues. Yeah, no question about it. Let's talk about Zayas, a guy we seem to mention every week on this show. This is a perfect trip. He's close early. He drops off the speeds. He saves ground when he sees what's going on with Mean Season. He adeptly gets around her, and he really made a difference with CZ. He really did. 
Bryan, and he's a strong finisher. I like everything I see from him. He's not winning when we're doing National Racing Report. He's hitting the board on long shots. He gave his horse a terrific ride, and I think this is a kid that at some stage you're going to see take the step and come up north. No, I, I love what I've seen from him. He, he, he is cool. He's a cool customer. Disappointing efforts in here. I mean, weekend hideaway, he didn't run a step after that sensational race the time before that. Had gotten the 108 buyer at his race prior, was the slight favorite, just didn't lift the hoof out there in the middle of the track, and Jacks are better farm. They breed a good one. Florida bred a uh, near 90 acre yeah, farm at Ocala, and all their homebreds are by their stallions and horses for the most part that you're not familiar with. It's pretty cool. No, it's very cool. It's easy as a really neat horse. All right, we'll set it to break. We've got a few more races to cover on this edition of the National Racing Report, including one from President's Day down in Maryland. Can you believe it? Less than two weeks out from that Saturday, March 7, Gotham Day program at Aqueduct First Post, won 20 a $300 live money on track handicapping contest. More information available at Naira.com. And spring eventually will be in the air, but a good start to the uh, the unofficial start of spring on Gotham Day. No, absolutely. We always, You and I always joke about it and excited to be getting there, and we're going to appreciate this spring and summer a lot after the winter we've had. Absolutely. <laughs> That's for sure. And BelmontStakes.com, don't forget there. But let's head down. Well, uh, Laura, we'll go back to a Monday President's Day. Solid group of horses, battled seven eights in the General George, and what a ride from Kendrick Carmouche on Miss Connect the Gray in the Orange Cap. Kendrick Carmouche has taken a little time getting used to the win winter meet, but I think he's ridden well here overall, especially for a guy just getting here. This was a sensational ride because he got this horse in position, he got off the deeper inside with him, he put him in the right spot, and Miss Connect rewards Bruce Levine, and he turns back and wins for him and Mike Rapoli. Yeah, and I was surprised off the turn back that he was able to get him into that good position early because a lot of times they'll get out-footed more and then to extricate himself from the traffic to get to the clear. That a terrific ride. And, and as always, I mean, Bruce Levine is just such a consistently good trainer year in, year out. It's nice to see him when he wins stakes. And he's another horse. You talk about dynamics. When he was in that prior race, the Jazzle, they went very, very fast early in that race, and he hung around to finish a reasonable third in there. He ran maybe the best race of anybody that day, and he was rewarded for turning back here, and we'll see what he can do and things get a little tougher in the Carter, but I wouldn't discount him, Jay. Grade one here on April 4th. Let's get you back at the fairgrounds as we wrap up the show. Race number 12 of 12. It's the Mineshaft Handicap and Michael Dilger shipping out to the Midwest and getting the upset in a big way on Saturday. This is a horse who's making his third start. He broke his maiden with Joel Rosario circling the field at Aqueduct and what is turning into a key race with Coach Inge running very well, winning two or three starts since that. Another horse for John Sheriff's winning in California. And there's another runner from this horse's maiden race that's running on Thursday named Hollywood something that you may want to put in your memory bank. You know, it's interesting watching it just now. It looked like, too, he got that good trip, came out, split horses, took the lead like he was going to drop. He looked like he got to pulling up when he hit the front, like there was more in the tank. Even though he was riding him hard to maintain his position, he just looked like he lost focus after he hit the lead. And it wasn't that bad an effort. Just his third career start. Right. still eligible for non-winners of one. Give some credit to Dilger for having the courage to go there. Yeah, he was in yeah. the uh, the winner circle with Scott Hazelton doing the post-race uh, interview on the uh, fairgrounds feed after getting the money with Street Babe, who's owned by Ann Stu. Gelding by Street Sense, and he was the one that topped an exacta that paid $1,100 with the runner-up mystery train wow. at 17 to 1 second. Pretty, pretty nice. Pretty amazing, that's for sure. And give him some credit for having the courage to make himself look like a fool. Instead, he looks like a genius. Fastest 30 minutes in all thoroughbred racing. It has come and gone. We have hit the finish line. We thank you again for tuning in. We've got the Jimmy Wingfield and additional stakes from around the country next weekend at Aqueduct on the National Racing Report. Have a great night.